Dovestone is a big partnership site with United Utilities. 4,000 hectares, so it's a big chunk of landscape to work on. We have an excellent partnership. We work together to restore the blanket bogs and to restore the moorland edge so we can sequester carbon, so we can slow water flow, so we can bring back biodiversity. But we would not be able to do any of it without these amazing guys behind us. So these are our volunteers. You can see what the weather's like today. They come out in all sorts of weather. I mean, very rarely do they get sunshine. Mostly like this, but colder and wetter. You feel as though you are doing something useful for helping climate change. At first you think, oh, it's quite a bleak area, but in fact it is full of life and you do learn quite a lot as well. A grip is the word we give to a small drainage channel, which were man-made drainage channels dug into the peatlands, mainly for agriculture to increase the fertility and the productivity of the land. Because they drain the land, they basically kill off the peatland, they kill the mosses, and that leads to more carbon. The peatlands hold more carbon than woodlands and when the peatlands drain they start to release that carbon into the atmosphere. So what we're trying to do now is restore them to stop them releasing the carbon. The main thing is to block them up. They place dams across the channel and that stops the water from draining out of it and they place them at regular intervals. So these peat dams are holding water back on the hill, which means that the peat stays saturated so it doesn't lose carbon. It means we're supporting all the really important insects that live up here. So that supports our birds and so on and so forth through the food chain. And it also means that when it rains, the water stays up here rather than rushing off the hill down to downstream communities. So what the volunteers are doing here is they are planting sphagnum moss around the peat dams. So this is sphagnum moss. It's a really pretty little plant, but what's really, really important about it is that it holds water. So peat dams are allowing us to start storing water below the soil surface level, as well as in pools. And this stuff holds water on the surface in the really long run. And you've got to look in the long run for the restoration of these amazing habitats. This is what's going to make water retentive peat. So in several centuries time, this will be peat under the ground holding water. And that's why we're reintroducing it. We're going to use AI to map firstly where the grips are, where restoration and conservation activities need to be done, and also to map how the moorlands and the peat changes over time. That will mean that there's more manpower and more spend to be used elsewhere and focus on the restoration, which is actually the bit that produces the most benefits. We've seen on some of these moorlands how much of a difference 5, 10, 15 years conservation work can make. So hopefully we'll be able to see some more sphagnum, some more repaired peatlands, and ultimately there'll be more carbon captured and a better world for everyone. Some fantastic footage there of the peatlands and the peat district. Why do you, what's, what's, why is peatland restoration so important? Well, as you can see in this map here, peatland is a global habitat around the world. That's a map from the International Peatland Society. We can see there's quite a lot of it, and we have quite a lot of it here in Northern Europe and here in the UK. Peatland is a carbon-rich ecosystem. In fact, it holds, it has the highest carbon density of any ecosystem in the world. Um, in fact, it has, it stores twice as much carbon as the world's forests. But grips are degrading this habitat. And unfortunately in the UK, a lot of the peatland um, is degrading. But we can, re uh, so that's, that means that it's um, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. But we can reverse that by blocking the grips and turning it into a carbon sink. Um, and that's why um, the uh, 2015 Paris Agreement requires us to, um, to keep the peatlands wet and to restore the peatlands. So as you can imagine, um, peatlands play a key role in flood defences. They are by definition um, an important wetland habitat. Um, so by blocking the grips, we can slow down the surface water runoff, increase water retention, uh, and reduce the risk of flooding downstream. They also hold a quarter of the UK's drinking water uh, and are really important for biodiversity. They harbour lots of rare plants, animals, and insect species. So as you can imagine, uh, peatland restoration is really high on the government's agenda. For example, the 2018 uh, UK peatland strategy sets out the target to restore 2 million hectares of peatland by the year 2040. So we think our, um, we, we think our uh, product can go a long way to achieving these aims. Um, so, so currently there is no national grip map. There's no national grip data set. We don't know where they all are but they are degrading our peatlands. So what our job is to go out and find them. So as Nick said, um, our national data peatland maps do not 
And this is primarily because it's manually laborious as well as financially expensive. And this is where AI can help. AI includes a plethora of algorithms and techniques which can do a, a multitude of things. Things like recognize patterns in images, identify specific objects, as well as put images into categories. Of all these AI techniques, convolu convolutional neural networks, convolutional neural networks, excuse me, that's a tongue twister, of AI, <laughs> one particularly successful technique. Their, their accuracy often <coughs> surpasses human expertise. And for this reason, CNNs form a core part of the solution that we are proposing. Specifically, we want to train a CNN to be able to tell us whether A, the grips exist in the first place or not, and B, if they exist, classify whether they are infilled or whether they remain unfixed. Our grand vision is to build a national database of these grips so that time and resources can be effectively channelized into restoration. Uh, and this support, this approach to supporting peatland restoration by harnessing AI is completely aligned with the net zero objectives included in the national AI strategy that was recently published. However, and there's always a however, <laughs> the training of CNNs require large amounts of labeled data. And that effectively means, you know, we're harking back to, this, uh, to the old question of, you know, whether the grips exist or not. We need labeled data of, you know, whether the grips exist or not and whether, you know, they're fixed or not. And we need data for that. And we do not have enough such images to train this, uh, the CNS for that. And that is the fundamental bottleneck that the proposal aims to uh, tackle. Uh, and to expand on this further, I'll pass it on over to Damien. Thank you, Arthur. If we can try a solution now using the logo for data challenge, and um, we can trace out the, uh, the, the logo using these green pixels here, which are the two-dimensional mathematical distribution, which we want the machine to learn. This is just two CNNs pitched against each other in a game called a GAN. And looking at the uh, model structure on the left, there, the lower loop is the first CNN. We call this a generator, and it's analogous to a, a banknote forger. It's throwing out these purple dots, which at first are no better than random noise. The second CNN there is the upper loop. We call that the discriminator, and following the analogy through this would be the police officer. And so the game continues, and lots and lots and lots of trials and errors. Each CNN learning by feedback to become better at its job. We don't have time to take the scan through to its completion here, but you can perhaps see after nearly 3,000 trials and errors, we're already getting somewhere near to the logo that it was given. So ultimately the GAN is there to um, produce a, a series of new images, fakes, but statistically similar to the image that it, it was given. So the point of the GAN in this exercise is to expand our training data set. We're stepping up a gear, and this is where we really need the help of the judges. Um, it turns out that if we give a GAN even more complex images, its ability to produce fakes becomes awesome. And you may, like me, be wondering which one of these is the fake, and if you are, then you're probably all correct. Every single one of these images was, was produced by a GAN, and all of these are fakes, and none of these people exist. I'm returning now back to the uh, Peatland Challenge. Um, the rationale is that with this expanded set of data, this source data on the left, the large training set, we can expect a better detection model for grips on peatland. And what we'd really like to do is take it all the way through to the dashboard on the right here, uh, and in so doing to tool up the users with unique, new and valuable information of where the grips are and how they're changing over time. And Maria will talk us through this dashboard. So the GANs give us a way of creating new labeled images, and using that, CNNs give us a way of detecting grips. We now need a way to make all of that information available to someone who's going to do the restoration. Imagine that person is you, and you're looking at this dashboard. Um, if we could play the video, please. Thank you. The first thing you'll see on the dashboard is the national view. The thing in yellow shows the distribution of peatland in England. But once our model is fully operational, you'll be able to see the distribution of grips for the whole of the UK. The table on the right-hand side shows you some statistics about the grips themselves and the carbon capture potential if all the grips were infilled. The chart on the bottom shows you how much of the grips have been infilled as the years go on and how much still needs to be done. All three of these things together form the national database that is currently missing. And that's the first gap that our dashboard continues to fill. We've also envisioned that the user will be able to zoom into a specific region or a peatland drop-down menu. 
At this level, you'll be able to see not just where the grips are, but which ones are infill and which ones still need fixing. That's the two colors that you see. The tables on the right update to reflect the area that you're looking at. And we've even added a column that tells you how much has been infilled since the previous year. This now allows for monitoring of the paint level, and that's the second gap that, that we are filling with that product. Let's zoom into a particular uh, peat length. At this level, you can, you, can, you can see the precise locations of the grips marked out in these lines. You can even click into individual grips so that you can see their length, their shape, and their status. That is, whether they're infilled or still need to be fixed. You can use the year toggle to compare what the same peat was looked like in the previous year or previous years. This again allows for us to monitor the peat month, now at a very local level. We could go further. We could add toggle options based on carbon capture potential so that we could support prioritization of restoration. In conclusion, our dashboard maps and digitizes grips in, in the UK. It allows for peatland restoration and the condition that we monitor across the years. And it can even allow for prioritization of restoration. And all of that is backed by modern state of the art research. So let's put some numbers to this. We know that the manual method is prohibitively expensive. Peatland in the UK covers a vast remote expanse, and if we multiply that by the time required to map a unit area of peatland, um, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you want to check the slides? You've got the slides. Sorry. Um, yeah, we get a cost of between five and seven hundred thousand pounds per year, making it impossible to map them all. In contrast, our proposed solution has a minimal setup cost and a fractional run cost. And this is where the power of this data challenge is realized. It frees up time and money for the valuable restoration and conservation of peatland. So if we forecast the cost over the next 10 years, for the manual method, we get a cost of six, very sorry, six million pound compared to our solution with a cost of 288,000 pound. That's a 5.7 million pound difference. Further value can be added by, for the following reasons. One, we can quickly see how effectively the peatland is or is not functioning. This can help us act faster and help the UK get to net zero quicker. Two, this IP is unique and globally applicable. We could gift it to the world, or we could commercialize it. Encouraging corporations to invest money in peatland through net uh, zero, sorry, carbon neutral schemes, similar to tree planting. And three, the positive benefits from flooding could help reduce insurance premiums and government payouts. So we can act quickly to realize these benefits. The data we are looking to use does not require legal or data protection approval. And the foundations are there for us to build upon, including a proof of concept with Microsoft. Our first step is to produce a national scale map of grips in the UK, but our solution is easily scalable. And this is because once we've trained our model to detect grips, it essentially doesn't matter where those grips are. Whether they're in Europe, where it's estimated that about 25% of their extensive peatland has been drained, or further afield in areas like Borneo, where um, vital habitats and ecosystems are at risk because of wetland drainage. Our solution is also replicable, and this is because GANs can help in other situations where CNNs are struggling because of a lack of training data. We've looked across the civil service and beyond and identified multiple cases where our solution could help with that. And this ranges from environmental analysis to problems in construction, such as detecting damage on road or railways. The most current and relevant example we found to this year is where they used a CNN to detect COVID-19 in chest x-rays. This paper found that the CNN struggled because of a lack of training data. These are exactly the kind of situations where our solution could help. Our solution can be applied across the civil service. One example is in forestry, where there's a growing appetite to use AI for monitoring pests and disease. Ash dieback is a devastating pathogen affecting 95% of UK ash species. Hyperspectral images record information beyond the visible spectrum, detecting biochemical markers associated with pathogens. 
This data, alongside AI, can detect disease before visible symptoms appear. However, this data is expensive to collect and often limited, making it difficult to train a classification model. GANs could supplement hyperspectral images, training the model more accurately while reducing training costs. And we've had such a fantastic journey getting to this stage. Thank you to the sponsors, judges and NTT Data for providing us with this wonderful opportunity. We believe that AI plays an important role for the restoration of peatland health, locking carbon back into the ground, reducing flood risks and assisting the government to achieve carbon emission targets. With your facilitation, we would like to further develop this idea to create a fully integrated working pilot for natural land, validating our approach and training the CNN model within approximately three months. The output will be a peatland map dashboard uh, available to the wider DEF family, civil service, academic bodies and members of the general public. Thank you again for listening. We feel passionate about AI for Peatland Health and we now hope that you do too. Thank you. Fantastic. Can I just ask a couple of questions just to check that I've understood everything. Um, the first question um, I had was just around the how you're able to get the observation data on the grips in a way which gives you enough data to be able to do everything else you need to do about their location, their extent, their condition. Um, I, 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 the, you have the picture of the, the poor people walking around trying to sort of draw the maps. So, that's, how do you scale that up? Thanks, Alex. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, luckily for us, the Ministry of Implementation at Clare Cabinet Office has provided access for all of the public sector for um, aerial imagery to a very high resolution, 12.5 centimetres, um, from a company called Aerial Photography of Great Britain. So we've, we've had a look at this and um, started to think about how uh, the harder part is, the, is actually uh, what we call bounding boxes. So uh, drawing the part that we want the machine to learn, and that's the time consuming step. We've looked at satellite data as well, and it's not actually not as good as, as, as what we get through the cabinets. So it's the old satellite flyovers, basically. Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah, yeah, right. Blue, blue sky, sure. various other names. Perfect. And then the other thing was that it was very interesting to see the, the GAN sort of uh, replicating the logo. Have you seen it trying to do something in such a complex, spongy shape as, uh, as one of the grips? Good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, an, an unknown to a certain extent. We've, we've had a play uh, in these last few months together since, mm. since we've come together with slightly uh, harder shapes than the data, data challenge logo. And I'll pass on to our, our panel in a minute. So, um, sorry, so you, you've been finished. Yeah, yeah, just to say, so we tried, tried with the uh, written uh, numbers, uh, yeah. which is a, a slight step up, but you're right. Um, the grips are um, more complicated, but still linear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so we have had a place, so for the same panels, we have developed a proof of concept as well, which could roughly recognize similar images and put bounding boxes around them. So, in the intervening four, you know, four weeks or so, uh, we uh, developed, we tried to develop the cancer a little further. And we were partly successful, and obviously using very limited resources and after a wall and everything, in sort of replicating uh, the the grips. It wasn't perfect, but it was you know getting there basically. But it's it's again like I said, it's just you know a few of us working after us on our personal computers. But just imagine if you know we had that you know the necessary funding, we could actually realistically achieve it. Can I just add, add to that? I think the proof of concept is kind of already out there because we saw from the the fake faces. Uh, it's, you know, it has been done to replicate quite complex imagery. Yeah. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, they are, they are squiggly lines. So, <laughs> it sounds funny, but that's true. So, Picture, uh, pictures are just so, numbers. So. Yeah, yeah the, like the grips themselves. So, they, they would be, I think on a technical level, they would be slightly easier than replicating faces. So, if something as complex as faces can be done, then definitely grips can be done. Yeah, I, th I think there's another benefit to your brilliant idea, and I, I really like the way you presented it. Uh, and that's this whole debate about we can't do things because we don't have enough data. Mm -hmm. And what you've proven is actually we're in a post-data age now. We're in the, we're in a time where AI can create the data for us, and uh, that that I think has wider applications whenever we're struggling with trying to find that data and you're, you're kind of leading the way. So have you given that some thought how some of this could be used in you know, areas that we really struggle with because of the quality of data? 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, the POC that we developed was developed from a previous project where we actually trans looked at handwriting recognition. So the POC itself is a validation of the very concept that we're talking about. Um, but I think there is a wider application in which, again, okay, it's about recognizing certain lines and certain patterns in objects. So if we can train, you know, to, to detect lines, you know, we can train it to kind of look at other things as well. Um, for example, um, in climate change itself, or especially in the state of financial services industries, uh, where there's real risk uh, to insurance companies, uh, etc. So you can kind of see how, you know, uh, how, how the show lines are uh, eroding or, you know, whether, whether assets are really at risk. So I think you can use GANs to kind of replicate the, that kind of erosion. So it's not just a moment in time, but also how things, you know, progressing over a period of time uh, using GANs. Um, you know, you can generate that sort of data. Yeah. And so then, yeah. Sometimes that's described as synthetic data. Right? Synthetic yeah. data, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you for clearing that up. Sorry, Sorry just to add on that, when we were looking at use cases, do you find So many in Ooh. terms of, you know, fire prevention, flood prevention, yeah. road erosion. We all we were almost a bit sort of, you know, how many can we list? <laughs> you know, this, this is such a powerful tool, especially sort of environmental aspect. It's just, yeah, yeah it's brilliant. Yeah, I think that's what we're kind of saying is that while peatland's really important and we want to do this with peatland, um, if we kind of were given the opportunity to develop this in the civil service, then we'd happily share that uh, expertise and that learning across all other departments where this could be useful, um, whether it's, you know, Public Health England on x-rays or local authorities for road damage. There's loads of opportunities across the civil service where this could be used. Can I yeah, just to add. <laughs> <laughs> on a really simplistic level, the more trained aid you can give a deep learning or, or convolutional neural network, the better you are. So I think GAN has really helped that. Because I'm glad Dale, you mentioned synthetic data because what I'm hearing is synthetic data generator being worked here where the use case scalable potential is, is quite enormous. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in where do you think the the, the unique innovation is within this proposition? Is it in the expansion of GANs in way they haven't been used before, or is it more the, the application in this particular challenge? I'll just quickly say my part and then pass on to Maria. Yeah, I think uh, twofold really, in that uh, we've done a lot of research to see if this has been done before. And some people have tried. The, the, the ultimate aim of being able to detect grips across England, let alone the UK, is, is, seems to be beyond reach and people have, people have tried and, and, and got somewhere near. Uh, so that would be part of the innovation, but the other one is, yes, this, this idea of cutting the, cutting the corner massively by using a GAN to um, reduce that step. And we, we did something similar recently with, with, with training at CNN without using a GAN, and it took us uh, four to five months to build up the training data set. So you'll be tuning um, the GAN for this particular. That's what we we are aiming to do. Yeah, it's kind of the the, the, the step. The, the ultimate step is CNN, which does the detection. But we'd like to we'd like to by, bypass that, and in so doing, that would be scalable as well. That that part the the, the GAN. Uh, you partly answered my question, but just to just to uh, sort of it, it kind of sounds as if the, the, the cost of doing this is relatively small and the benefit is huge. So what's in the way of just getting it done? <laughs> I think, so, sorry, I'll pass on to you. I'll it, 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 it's, it's, to, to this point, it's, it's been uh, a question of getting enough people together to do it and, and, and the manpower and the expertise to do it. And it seemed like an impossible task, um, as Rachel was setting out early, earlier. You know, this would, this would take 13, 15 people per year, every year, repeating. Um, so that would be my view. I'll pass on to that. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the answer, of course, uh, which is, you know, the people aspect of it. But apart from that, and this is where I think, you know, the civil service, you know, this data challenge would be very useful, and the fact that we need the infrastructure for it as well. So the funding that we go can kind of help us build that infrastructure, scale that infrastructure, which are, you know, very likely issues, but then, they are very, very important ones in kind of helping us lay that foundation. And then obviously we need the people with the skills and everything to train them up. So it's a mix of technology, people, infrastructure. So it's about capability, role and sponsorship, or, or uh, sort of teasing out, you know, is, it, is it about getting policy people and, and, and the people in, in, in natural England to really yeah. buy into the so concept Getting the people well. together and then kind of helping, you know, like really getting down to the, getting that, you know, dirty with the technology and, you know, building up that infrastructure. And there's also an element of the guns is the innovative part, yeah. right? And yeah. they are very new technologies. So yeah. like, and while the proposed 
as early as 2015, they still didn't come along away until like the last three or four years. Yeah. So, so the fact that they now have a way of giving us this label data set, that, that also like opens new doors for us to explore. Yeah. yeah, that's what this team hopes to do. I was just saying we have 20 seconds left if there's a final question. A very quick one. Is there any sense that higher resolution source data will give you a better outcome or are you satisfied with what you've got? I think for the time being we're satisfied, but always predicting in the future that there will be something better and that will make it easier for the model to perform. But we, we're aiming high at the moment. It's not quite as simple as that though, because high resolution data, you know, it means you've got bigger data sets. So there's like a balance there between getting the detail um, and getting the, the results. It's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm afraid the time is up. I can't think of a you know, a, a better way to finish, I think, our final pitch, all about tackling climate change, protecting biodiversity. I mean, what bigger challenge could there be? So thank you so much to our final team. I'll invite you guys to go off. I'll invite you to go and have a